Hello, Chart Watchers, and welcome to Market Watchers Live with Aaron Swenlin and Tom Bowley. I'm your host, Tom Bowley. Today's show is being recorded, so you should be able to play back any or all of Market Watchers Live at your leisure. If you're unable to attend the show live, you can now go to www.stockcharts.com slash webinars. Follow the link to Market Watchers Live and play back the show. Each show will be archived until the next show begins, so it'll generally be archived for a couple of days. During today's show, please feel free to submit your ticker symbol requests, questions, and comments using the chat window next to the video player. Later in today's show, Aaron will provide me stock symbols from your questions, and I'll use those requests in the 10 in 10 segment at 1250 Eastern Standard Time, where I'll attempt to annotate 10 stocks in 10 minutes. Market Watchers Live now airs on Monday through Friday from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you'd like to be part of the show, you can reach us via our chat room or Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Market Watchers Live. That's at MKT Watchers Live. Uh, bottom right hand part of your screen, you'll see an area, How'd We Do? There's a link that you can click on. And as you exit today, we'd love to get a little bit of feedback from you. Just a quick question on what you thought of the show and where we can improve. Um, we do use those comments in uh, determining the direction of the show as we go forward. So we'd love to hear from you. For those of you joining us for the first time today, welcome to the show. We are certainly glad to have you, and for our regulars, welcome back. Well, a couple of things here uh, quickly to announce. First, um, we had Chip Anderson, president of Stock Charts, on the other day, and he made a couple of very big announcements, one being that Market Watchers Live will be moving to five days a week, so no longer just Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We'll now be doing it Monday through Friday at the same time, 12 o'clock through 1.30, so the same hour and a half. Um, I think that's a pretty exciting announcement. Also, Chip went into some discussion about having a 24-7 uh, streaming feed here at Stock Charts. So it won't just be for Marco Watchers Live, but we are looking to uh, really expand the uh, learning opportunities here at Stock Charts. And um, so you want to keep, you know, stay posted uh, for that. We'll continue to provide you some updates there. Uh, later in this show, I will be going over uh, candlesticks. So if you're a candlestick fan, I'm going to show you some reversing candlesticks and how to potentially use those in your technical analysis. Um, next Friday, Aaron is going to be doing a special segment on chart patterns. So make sure that you have your calendar marked for next Friday. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it for today. So a few announcements there, Aaron. But how are you doing today? I'm doing quite well. Um, it's very cool here. It's actually, we've got highs uh, not even to 70, so high 60s. We're really enjoying it. I can get my sweaters back out and my sweatshirts wow. because, you know, 68 is really cold. <laughs> well, I was able to actually get out and play golf yesterday, yesterday afternoon here in the Charlotte area. It was about, I don't know, 75, 77 degrees. It was a beautiful day in the afternoon. So I was able to take advantage one last time before we go to five days a week next week. Yes. <laughs> And uh, so it was, it was a lot of fun. It was a beautiful day here in the Southeast U.S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's going to really cut into your time now, huh? The Monday through Friday. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. I think we need to get Greg Schnell on here quite a bit. He needs to be our back. There you go. So, uh, I still got to get out the golf course once in a while. Gotta, mm -hmm. You know, you got to get out and just kind of relax and get away from the market sometimes. It's uh, a little tough when you're watching it you know, minute by minute throughout the day, every day. So uh, never hurts to get away for a little bit. And that's why what we always encourage in the weekend, you know, spend some time with your family, get away from this stuff for a little bit um, because it is kind of intense to just be uh, looking at it day after day, you know, minute by minute, so forth. Right. Exactly. I don't know. My, my husband's not real thrilled that I still talk shop all over the weekend. <laughs> so It's hard to get away from it. Huh? Yes. Yes. Uh, I figure I'll just uh, let you know what's going on the agenda today because it's I know you have your workshop to do, so we don't want to take up too much of your time. So we will do the market updates on the half hour. We may end up skipping the se second one, depending on uh, what Tom's up to and talking about. Uh, talking technically, I think we're going to go over a little bit there. Um, some of the news of the day. Uh, and then Tom is going to be doing his workshop on reversing candlesticks. So you'll definitely want to hang around for that. 10 and 10 to 1, we're taking your symbol request. Uh, Tom's going to annotate 10 stocks in 10 minutes uh, as best we can and he can. 
And our first stock is going to be ECA. So you might want to take a look at it and then you can compare notes with Tom when we do that sec uh, segment. Uh, John Hopkins will be in here briefly to go over uh, some interesting earnings reports. I'm going to give you the, the uh, dish on sentiment and you can see what's going on with that. And then if we have time, we will answer some questions, mailbag questions, and then we'll just be wrapping this thing up. And with that, I guess I'll get started with our first market update. I miss it when we say this market update brought to you by. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm going to take you right into our candle glance so you can see what the heck's going on today. Uh, we see the Dow, really in the markets are mostly unchanged with the exception being the NASDAQ, which has been climbing ever since the open. So it's uh, reaching some intraday highs now. So that it's interesting to see technology doing so well, but the rest of the market hasn't been doing that great. Uh, Russell 2000, small caps have been in the negative pretty much all day, trying to uh, get back into the black, but not uh, able to do so just yet. Treasury yields mostly unchanged. You can see uh, the dollar is up. When we look at UUP, it's formed uh, what looks like a possible bull flag uh, on the intraday chart. We can see commodities are lower. Oil USO is very interesting. I'm going to show you a chart of that uh, shortly, but we're seeing uh, almost no change here, but we had an important signal that I want to show you when we finish this. And we can see gold is lower. Not surprised when we see that the dollar is higher at this point. VIX is moving lower. We're now seeing some readings uh, below nine and a half, currently at 9.37. It's a lot of complacency out there. We can see that uh, declines are leading advances right now on the New York Stock Exchange. But I promised you I would show you the USO chart because uh, I think that's pretty interesting right now. The, the big signal that I got to, uh, yesterday, actually, the 50-day EMA just crossed above the 200-day EMA. And with decision point analysis, that tells us that we are now in a long-term bull market. Uh, so that's that's good news for oil. And we can see uh, right now, I think we're we're heading up here to this area of overhead resistance, but I don't think it's going to pose too much trouble. I'm going to keep an eye on that PMO, though. It is still rising, but it is getting overbought. And that's all I have for our first market update. OK, sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and just uh, pull up the chart on the uh, TNX the 10-year Treasury yield. And as a, you can kind of take a look at this, we've been pulling back here for the past several days, um, still holding above the prior low. So we do have a nice little uptrend that's been in play for about two months here. But uh, you can kind of take a look at this chart while I go through some of these economic reports. This morning, non-farm payrolls came out. This was a big one. I thought we'd have a really big number. Uh, consensus estimates were looking for a huge number. Uh, non-farm payrolls came in at 261,000. The market was looking for 325,000, so it was a little bit below expectations. But if you recall, last month the number was negative. Actually, went uh, down 33,000 as a result of the hurricanes, or at least that's what everything was blamed on. So we were looking at a snapback, and I know uh, a number of the estimates were expecting a higher number, but 261,000, pretty good number. Private payrolls came in 252,000. Market was expecting 320,000. The unemployment rate. Uh, was 4.1%, market expecting 4.2, so slightly lower than expected there. Average hourly earnings, I was pretty interested in this number last month, if you remember, uh, came in at 0.5%, a rise of 0.5% in average hourly earnings, and that can start to signal some wage inflation. Um, and the uh, yield, actually, if you take a look at this chart, this was the Friday that uh, the jobs report came out last month, and you can see that we we spiked up to the 240 level on the heels of that jobs report. And a lot of it, I think, related to the fact that the average hourly earnings had spiked so much. But this month, that number came in flat, 0.0%. Um, the market was looking for a slight rise of 0.2%. So now you can see a little bit of the, the, the flip. We were going higher and we put in a short term top. And now this time we're actually going lower into the report and possibly putting in a short-term bottom. We'll have to wait to see. But we were much lower earlier today on the TNX. We had gotten down to 2.32%, and now we're back up close to 235 So that's uh, something to keep in mind. Uh, also this morning, September factory orders came in. 
at a uh, gain of 1.4 percent. The market was looking for 1.2 percent. October PMI Services Index 55.3, market expecting 55.9. The October ISM non-manufacturing index was 60.1 versus 58.6 expected. And then uh, finally, yesterday, we had the Q3 productivity uh, number come in at 3%, a positive 3% gain or rise relative to um, the 2.5% rise that was expected. So productivity gains were better than expected. And also the uh, initial jobless claims yesterday came in 229,000, which was a little bit better than the market was looking for at 235,000. So you put all that up into a ball, uh, spin it around, and what we've come up with here on the 10-year Treasury yield is that we're basically flat. Um, so the market looked at all of that, and uh, or the bond market, I should say, looked at all of that, and uh, we're simply closing or we're at right now where we had closed yesterday. So market, I don't think can really make too much of it. I actually am looking for this yield to start to bounce um, off of this decline. And the fact that we came in with numbers that really should send the yield lower and it did earlier, but we're reversing off of it. So if we finish fairly strong on the yield today, uh, I would say 235 or above, I'm going to be looking at today's low as a pretty important short term support area on the yield and be looking for a move back to the upside. So we had some big earnings reports out. I don't know if you've heard of this company or not, but Apple reported last night. And uh, it was a great report. They did, uh, the company did gap up, reported strong revenues, strong earnings per share. We did get a, a corresponding gap up, so it looks very similar to what we saw last week about this time when we had Amazon, Microsoft, Alphabet, or Google, and uh, Intel all report better than expected numbers and all of them gapped up and look strong on their charts and apple did the same thing one disappointment this week has been facebook and i think there was just a lot of good stuff built into the report you can see that for about four or five days leading up to the earnings we had been rising and the numbers weren't bad and you can see that the volume was very heavy on that move to the upside so i think there was a lot of accumulation but we've since uh, pulled back on on uh, Facebook, and it looks like we're getting down close to a key area of support. Uh, I wrote about this a little bit in my blog this morning, but I was looking for Facebook to show some support between about 174 and 177, and we're at 177 in change right now. We got down as low as 176.71, so I think coming off of the earlier highs in the 180s, I think this area would be a pretty decent short-term support. I'm not talking about long-term, so if this gives away it's not like I'm, I would be writing off Facebook, but I just think in the short term, you've got gap support, you've got this rising 20-day moving average, and you can see that we've had tops coming across here uh, about 175 to 177, and we cleared that with big volume, so I would expect that area to hold as short-term support on the way back down. So those are some key areas to at least consider on Facebook. As far as the individual sectors go, Financials, uh, actually with the yield dropping earlier today, I think the financials were down a little bit more than the rest of the market today, but that's fine. Financials were leading yesterday, and so we're just continuing to get this rotation, but you can see financials down at the bottom, really the only group that's uh, showing much weakness at all today. Utilities, uh, of course, they are on the other side of the spectrum in terms, terms of interest rates, and when interest rates drop, utilities tend to benefit, so I think that, that earlier jobs report really helped the utilities while hurting the financial. So you can see those on opposite ends of the spectrum. Technology doing well, as you might expect, with Apple performing as well as it is. So overall, I think the action today continues to be bullish, but the overall market's not exactly taking off. It's just continuing to meander its way to the upside. And the last thing I wanted to point out is I always watch the volatility index and check out since topping near 11 yesterday, we have been going straight down on the VIX. We are now back down into the low nines, close to nine and a quarter. We really haven't had many readings at this level in history. So this is a pretty low historic level for the volatility index, which tells me that this bull market lives on. And, uh, you know, you're not going to, you rarely are going to start. I can't imagine that we would start a bear market with a VIX reading in the nines. It's going to take a lot more um, anticipated volatility or expected volatility for the market to break down. And so I would be, I, I would think that the VIX is gonna start from a much, much higher level when we do in fact 
top longer term. So anyhow, with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and head into the reversing candlesticks segment that uh, I had promised. <laughs> and I'm going to start first. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on basic candlestick construction, but I think it's pretty important to understand some of the concepts that I talk about with reversing candles. Um, and if you don't understand basic candlestick construction, it's going to probably be a, a really difficult 30, 20, 30 minutes to, to sit through. So with a basic candlestick construction, you really have four things. You have the high, the low, the close, and the open. And I used the candle from yesterday on BDX as an example of what candlesticks are and how they're um, constructed. Anytime you see the top of a candlestick for a particular day, this was uh, November 2nd, yesterday, and you can see that the, the uh, low part of this candlestick comes down to about 210 or just below 210. So that's the low. Anytime you see this long, thin line come down to the bottom, that's going to be the low. The top is going to be your high of the day. And then the rectangle that forms is going to determine the open and the close. If you have a hollow candle, this is a hollow candle. Nothing's inside of it. It's just black hollow candle. If you have a hollow candle, it means that the close is above the open. And generally, that's bullish. Um, just if you think about it, okay, we opened here. And now currently, or well, yesterday we closed up here. So it means we went up throughout the day. So that has a little bit of bullish undertones to it. And if you have a filled candle, you'll see a lot of these candles on here, big red candle right here. That just means the opposite. You can see these little thin lines that come out the top and the bottom. Again, those are, that's the high and low of the day. But this red filled candle means that you're closing below the open. So it kind of gives a little bit more of a bearish tone um, because it's going down. BDX went down that day from the open throughout the day. Now it did go a little bit lower intraday, so it came up a little bit off that low, but it's still closed toward the bottom of that candlestick. So it's just a little bit of a, well, not a little bit, when you get a big red candle like that, and especially with volume increasing, that's a, a kind of a bearish um, backdrop for this particular stock. So that's the basics. And I could go into a lot more of the construction, but for now, I'm just gonna hold it there and just so that you have a general sense as we go through these other charts um, exactly what we're looking at in terms of candlesticks. The first reversing candlestick that I want to talk about, and, these, and the next three or four charts I go over, these will be more bearish reversing candlesticks. That doesn't mean that if you see one of these candlesticks, oh my gosh, there's a bear market coming or the stock is topped forever. That's not what these mean. These are very short term in nature. So when you think about reversing candlesticks, I wouldn't be thinking... I'm going to short sell and I'm going to come back in six months and see where it's at. Uh, that is not a very good uh, uh, strategy for trading the market, especially when you're in a bull market. Um, but here you can see this is a black candle. Now, this is filled, and I just talked about a red-filled candle. So here's a black-filled candle. What the heck does a black-filled candle mean? Well, number one, any filled candle means you're closing below the open. So it doesn't matter if it's red or black. It means you're closing below the open. So that's not a good thing. The difference between black and red is that a black candle, even though you're closing below the open, you're still closing above the prior day's close. So you, if you just went off you know, to work one day and you had no idea what had happened in the market and you come back and you look and you see your stock's up 50 cents and you say, oh, wow, I'm, you know, it's a good day. I went up 50 cents. Well, without seeing the candlestick, that part's true. But when you look at this, not every candlestick is created equal. And when you get a big gap up like this off of an uptrend and then come back down and close well off of that earlier open and put this big black candle right at the top of this uptrend, that is a, many times a short term reversing sign. So what is a black candle? Well, number one, it follows an uptrend. So we're looking for bearish reversing candles. So it's obviously got to follow an uptrend. If there's no uptrend in play, then these black candles would mean nothing. So the first thing you're looking for is, is there a prior uptrend? And here, I think there clearly is. We were going up for probably 10, 12 days in a row, uh, mostly, before we put in that, that candle at the top. So you gap higher. You have to gap higher on a black candle. 
it's impossible to gap lower or you would never have a black candle. So you gap higher, you close below the open, but above the prior day's close. That's why it's the black field versus the red field, because you're still closing with gains that day, even though you're well below the open. Uh, this black candle signals that the rally is likely extended, or maybe a better word be overextended, that it's just been going on for a while, and that market makers are short or potentially could be short now or a special uh, specialist. But what I'm looking at here, and the reason I say that is market makers provide liquidity in stocks. That's, that's their primary role. So if you want to buy a stock and you put an order in to buy a stock, now if you're going to buy Intel or something that's very liquid, chances are there's somebody on the other side that's willing to sell it to you. But many stocks, you might say, I want to buy and there are not enough sellers out there to sell to you. In that case, market makers are taking the other side of the trade. And so they're providing liquidity by going short. Now, if you know anything about market makers is that over time, they don't lose money. In fact, I remember Goldman Sachs back in 2010 bragging about how in the first quarter of 2010, and keep in mind, this was right on the heels of one of the worst bear markets we had ever seen. But Goldman Sachs was, was boasting that they had made money in their market making unit every single day of the first quarter of 2010, right on the heels of that bear market. And I just remember watching that thinking, wow, that takes a lot of guts to get up there. And after everybody seen half their portfolio wiped out the last two years to, uh, and I think it was on the uh, Charlie Rose show, but I, I was thinking it takes a lot of guts to get up there and brag about how much money you're making at the expense of everyone else. But anyway, that's what market makers do. They, they provide liquidity and they get on the other side of the trade. And so a lot of times if you can figure out what they're doing or if you have a general sense of what market makers are likely up to, you got a better chance of making money because they don't lose. So in this case, after stock goes up, you see the, the, the big gap up and the failure. And that's a pretty good sign that probably the buying, at least in the short term, is exhausted. And as a result, market makers are probably on the short side and we're likely, not guaranteed, but likely to see a pullback in the near term. And you can see with MSA here, we did pull back over the next couple of days, hit that rising 20 day moving average, maybe established a little bit of a uh, support area, and then we bounced off the 20. So again, it's not like it's a long term kind of a signal. It can be, but in a, in a bull market, I would not expect these reversing signals uh, to be long-term in nature. I'd, be, I'd expect them to be more short-term. Uh, higher volume helps to confirm the pattern. And if you look down here, you'll see that the volume did pick up on this last hurrah to the upside. The volume definitely picked up, gapped up, and then we sold off during the day. And it just tells you, again, that there's probably some market maker activity on the short side. And then finally, other technical signs should be considered. I would not just buy or sell based on a candlestick. You really want to try to put more pieces of the puzzle together. In this case, not only were we gapping up and failing with this black candle off an uptrend, but notice we had a negative divergence in play. So price action was already telling us that momentum was slowing, that price momentum was slowing. And now we're getting a candlestick to confirm it. So those are some of the things that I'd be looking for. So anyway, that's a black candle. Let's keep moving. Next up is the shooting star candle. And I pulled up the Dow Jones U.S. Gambling Index as an example. I actually wrote about this either in my blog or maybe in the Don't Ignore This Chart blog back when this occurred. But we had gone up for a couple of weeks in a row. We got all the way back up to this prior resistance area. And we gapped up, moved up intraday, and we reversed back down and closed. It looks like an upside down hammer. And we'll talk about hammers a little bit later. But really, it looks like an upside down hammer where you have an intraday move that was much higher, but notice that the open and the close are down here on the bottom of this candlestick. So a shooting star candle follows an uptrend. If you're looking for a reversal, again, you need to have a trend in play. So you got a pretty nice uptrend here. It gaps and trades higher intraday, but closes well off its high, leaving a long tail to the upside. And usually, I didn't put this in here, but normally the open and the close are both down in the lower third, maybe half, but even better if it's in the lower third of the candlestick so that your open 
is down toward the bottom of the candle. You go up intraday, look like you're breaking out, looks awesome. And by day's end, it's come all the way back down. You failed to hold that breakout. So a false breakout, you've probably heard me talk about that quite a few times. Anytime I get a false breakout like this with a long tail above resistance and come back down, that is, that's a pretty good short-term uh, sell signal. So once again, it signals that the rally is extended. And when you're getting this breakout intraday, most technical buyers or most technical traders would be buying this breakout. The fact that it failed tells me that it's probably market maker intervention in the short term, meaning that we're probably going to see some weakness. And we have not been able to, it's been over two months now, or been about two months, and we still have not cleared this level on the gambling index, although we have uh, been uh, strengthening again. And I think this does is starting to look much better technically and probably going to get that breakout. But anyhow, that was the sign that that shooting star gave us. All right, let's move on. The bearish engulfing candle. All right, same thing uh, or very similar to the black candle, except this would have been a black candle if it had closed above the prior close. In this case, we actually came down and completely engulfed that prior day's candle. So that is the big difference between a black candle and a bearish engulfing candle is that you, you don't stop selling where you still have a gain. You actually continue selling until you actually have a loss and completely engulf that prior day's candlestick. Look at the volume there. So what are you looking for with a bearish engulfing candle? Number one, again, follows an uptrend. If you see an engulfing candle, here's an engulfing candle right here, but it's been going sideways for five days and really didn't do anything on the chart. This one, because of, its, of coming off an uptrend and the fact that we have a negative divergence, I think is very bearish, not to mention the fact that volume is off the chart. So with a bearish engulfing candle, you follow an uptrend, you gap higher. Here's your open way up here from the prior day's close. So here's your higher gap at the open. You sell off all day, basically all day, and you end up closing beneath the prior day's candle, um, completely engulfing the prior candle. So there is your bearish engulfing. It signals once again that this rally is probably extended and that market makers are likely on the short side. And so you're going to look for short-term weakness, which we did see here the next couple of days. Now we're consolidating. And notice the pullback. We came right back down to a price support level where we had held uh, back in October. And now we're simply consolidating here sideways. So this doesn't necessarily have to be a longer-term bearish signal. We may simply see some consolidation and then a breakout and a move back up to retest the top of that candlestick. Higher volume helps to confirm that reversal. Again, if it's light volume, if I saw, you know, volume bar here that was, you know, among the lowest, then, you know, has have the market makers really gone short? Kind of hard to argue if there's not much volume. It's hard to argue that anybody's really done too much. So that would just be more manipulation than anything as far as I'm concerned. But when I see the heavy volume, it tells me there's quite a bit of distribution taking place after the open. And then once again, other technical signs to confirm what you think is a short-term top. Well, here with this gap up and failure, we had a negative divergence on in play. One other thing, I don't want to make turn this into a MACD discussion, but just make sure I, I actually connected the uh, close with the open. MACDs are based on closing prices. So really this line should be drawn down here. I just didn't want to com confuse everyone by drawing it in the middle of the candlestick. But really it, it's based on higher close, which we have, and a lower MACD reading, and then we get a reversing candle right on the top. All right, dark cloud cover candle. Um, this is the last of the bearish reversing candles that I wanted to cover. But a uh, dark cloud cover is just an, a bearish engulfing candle that didn't quite get there. So in this case, off of an uptrend again, you can see we had a gap up. A bearish engulfing candle would completely engulf this prior candle. But notice this one stops short. It gets into the lower half of the prior day's candle, but it doesn't completely engulf it. So this is a bearish engulfing candle that didn't quite make it, which means that it's a dark cloud cover candle. Um, for me, I think the bearish engulfing candle is more bearish simply because you have more weakness and you completely get rid of all those gains from the prior day. 
in this case, you're just getting rid of more than half of them. So again, follows an uptrend, and this is a two candlestick pattern. I should have mentioned that as well with the bearish engulfing candle. It, it, it's really two, two candlesticks. You have to compare one to the other to determine whether or not it's a bearish engulfing or dark cloud cover. So here you're looking at two candlesticks, and this one you do come down in the lower half. So you're gapping above the prior day's close um, or the prior day's candle. You're, you're gapping up. And then you're finishing in the lower half of the prior day's candle. So if you come down and you just finish in the top half or top third, that's not a dark cloud cover. And that really isn't showing a lot of weakness. What you're trying to do, and you have to think about these candlesticks, I think, using common sense. Um, if, you're, if you're gapping up and you come down and you're basically right about where the close was yesterday, how much selling have you really seen? Is that a real true reversal? I would say no. If, however, you gap up and then you sell and you wipe out most of the prior day's gains, then yeah, that to me seems like maybe things are reversing. And certainly if you have a bearish engulfing candle and you wipe out all the prior day's gains with heavy volume, that would seem to be, uh, at least seem to me, to be a situation where we're just way overextended, probably overbought. And in many of these cases, when you do see a reversing candlestick hit, you're probably going to be overbought because they tend the ones that matter uh, follow an uptrend. So you're going to be trending higher for a period of time, probably moving into overbought territory, and then you get these reversing candles to kick in. All right, so those are more on the bearish side of things. So I'm going to move over now, and I'm going to pull up a few of these bullish signs, bullish candles. So let's first go with the red hollow candle. Now, if you think back to what I talked about with the black candle, this is the exact opposite. So the black candle is a bearish candle that follows an uptrend. The red hollow candle is a hollow candle that follows a downtrend to mark a bottom. So you're following a downtrend. You gap lower, but you close above the open and below the prior day's close. So what this means is normally when you see these hollow candlesticks like this one over here, See how it's outlined in black and this one is outlined in red. The difference, both of them, you're closing above your open. The difference is in this case, we are closing well above the prior day's close. So we're actually making money. The hollow, the red hollow candle, you're losing money. If you held it from the prior day, this close is actually below the prior day's close, but your close is well above the open. So you gap down. You rally back. You don't quite get back to the prior day's close, but you do trade up from the open that day. And you can see the heavy volume pick up. So off of this, you might say, well, this is just the second day off this downtrend. Does that qualify? And you got to use a little bit of judgment. But in this case, the stock was about $145 and went down to almost $130 in two days. That's about a 10% move in one full trading day and another open. It's a pretty substantial move in terms of um, percentages. So I would say yes, off of this downtrend with the volume picking up, losing 10% a very short period of time, I would pay attention to these reversing candles. And the fact that this one also came right at this price support level. See how we had gapped down here and held and then rallied off of that? Well, I, I follow the closing, the opens and the close um, on the candlesticks more than I do the intraday. Uh, I just, I like to know where market makers are willing to close, open and close stocks. So if you're going to have a breakdown intraday, for instance, a lot of times market makers will begin buying in the afternoon. You come back up and that earlier breakdown is gone and you have this, this potential recovery. So I always find it interesting where uh, stocks do close at the end of the day. So anytime I see a tail that goes down below solid um, closing or opening support and then rally back above it, I tend to view that pretty bullishly. And here off of this downtrend, you've got the hollow candle. So you got a, you're following a downtrend, you gap lower, you close above the open, but you close below the prior day's close. So it is a down day, but certainly much better than it was at the open. And it just suggests that there's this accumulation taking place 
by somebody, and I'm going to assume market makers or maybe their clients, um, at support. And you can see that was the low. We never went back down below it, and we continued rising off of it. So that was a pretty significant low that Adobe had back in June. So this signals that a decline is likely extended or overextended and that market makers are on the long side now. And the higher volume helps to confer confirm that reversal or potential reversal. And as always, other technical signs should be considered. In this case, I'm looking at price support, which is the major technical signal as far as I'm concerned. Next stock or next uh, candle stick did, is the I hammer. I have a question for you real quick. Sure. Um, and you can probably answer it on both sides when you finish uh, the bullish ones. But uh, one of our viewers uh, asked, what is worse, uh, shooting star, black bar, or bearish engulfing? So like, is there a particular one that's worse than the other? I don't really like any of them. And I think, again, it comes down to how many different signals are being provided when you see those reversing candles. I, I don't like any of them. I think they're all bad. I would say bearish engulfing to me is probably worse than a black candle just because a black candle you do, you don't see the selling continue all the way through the prior day's candle. So it cuts off earlier than that. But mm -hmm. off of an uptrend, it's still, and on heavy volume can be a very bearish signal. The uh, shooting star candle, I never like to see tails. If, you know, we get questions all the time, when's the best time to sell? If you're a trader, one of the worst things to see if you're holding a stock and you've been making money and it's trending up and it gets to resistance and it goes through it intraday and fails to hold it by the end of the day, that to me is a sign I'm getting out because you've just failed to make a breakout and you may be heading right back down toward the support area. And as a trader, that's the last thing you want to do. You don't want to see profits, you know, go up and then completely erode and, you know, you get into that game and then, then it gets very emotional. So I think when you get up and you hit resistance, and especially when you go through resistance intraday and you don't um, and you don't sustain it into the close, I think that's particularly bearish in the near term. And I almost always would consider that a sell signal. Okay. Thanks. All right. Good questions. Um, so let's move on to the hammer. This is one of my favorites. I like I really enjoy trading hammers. Um, just because it's not just the name. I mean that to me that it just implies that you're hammering out a bottom. When you see a hammer off of a downtrend, and of course, again, you're looking for reversing candlesticks. So you have to have a prior trend in play for a hammer to be meaningful. Um, but here you can see sideways consolidation on Caterpillar for several months, and then it gaps up. And this was an earnings related gap up. And as I've said before, I like to wait and be patient on these stocks that gap up with earnings. And so I'm always looking for price support, gap support, 20-day uh, moving average, and I'm looking at the candlesticks. And here's a, a good example of having price support at about 97 on the stock. It had gapped up, went as high as 105, came all the way back down to price support in the rising 20. So that might have been a potential entry. And I certainly would have entered if I'd seen a hammer print right here with maybe a tail coming down below, say, to 96 and a half and then a recovery back up to, say, 97. But it didn't happen that way. But anyway, we got a bounce. And then the second move down did go below. This is that intraday move. So this is almost the opposite of that shooting star, where you gap, uh, in this case, you gap down, you trade down below that support area, and then you reverse back up and close near the high of the day. So when you start seeing these types of candles, and again, nothing is a guarantee. I'm not trying to promote guarantees because I can tell you there are none. The only thing I can guarantee you is that there are no guarantees. Um, but this is a, a really nice reversal. And the thing that these hammers do, and really any of these reversing candles, is it tells you where to consider placing your stop. So if this truly is a reversing candle and this truly is the low that we're going to see in the near term, then why would you hold it if it goes below? I mean, then you're going to start making excuses and say, okay, well, I'm going to wait till gap support. Oh, that didn't hold. Well, let's take a look at that prior low. Or how about this gap support? Or how about all these lows? We have great support down here. Let's just hold it to 89. Well, as a short-term trader, that's not really what I want to do. Because if you get into this stock with the idea that you're going to trade it back up to, say, 104 or 105, by the time you let this thing get all the way down to 89, 
were you really intending to give this stock $8 to the downside while you try to make eight to the upside or seven? Probably not. So what you've done is you've taken a really solid reward to risk trade and you've turned it into a really bad one. So that is why I think these reversing candlesticks are so important because they do give you signals for exit to the, to the downside. So keep that in mind, but this one reversed nicely and then continued moving higher, eventually taking out these highs. And this is back in June. So Caterpillar, I think is much higher at this point, but um, this, that's at least a, an indication of what you look for. So a hammer follows a downtrend. It trades intraday below the prior day and possibly below recent lows. And so that's what I'm looking for. I want to see new sellers coming in, people that are looking back and seeing a key area of support. And when it goes down intraday, they're going to put their stops out there. And so these stops are going to get triggered. And guess who's going to be buying them? On a reversing candle, it's going to be the market makers because who else is going to buy a breakdown? I'm not going to buy a breakdown. If I see a stock breaking down and volume picking up, last thing I'm going to do is put in a buy order. So these reversing candles really give you that signal that, there was probably market maker action in accumulating these shares on that false breakdown. We did get a question. Yep. Uh, where do you enter on a bullish hammer uh, reversing day? I mean, the day it forms, the next day waiting for confirmation. Uh, well, if there's, yeah, there's a number of things that I would consider. And it really depends on how actively you can follow the market, your experience, your risk tolerance. I mean, it comes down to a lot of different things. But one of the things I do is if I see a stock breaking down, if I'm literally at my computer and I'm watching it and I see it break down intraday and I see the volume picking up, I won't do anything at that moment, except I might put a stop buy order in instead of a stop sell. Um, I would put a stop buy in, meaning that if I see it reverse and get back up above a certain level, I would, I would then buy at that point. Now, the risk there is that you buy on a move back up intraday, which looks really good intraday, and by the end of the day, it sells back off again, and you're stuck with the loss. Um, that, that's the problem. Probably for me, the best time would be toward the close. At that point, you already know uh, essentially what has happened with that candle and with that day's action in that stock. And so a reversal and a you know 355, five minutes before the close, if I see I've got a really nice reversing candle in play, um, I would buy then. The problem with waiting until the next day is a lot of times you get a gap up after a reversal like that. And then you're like, okay, yeah, that, that hammer worked. Let me jump in. Well, you've already given up, you know, however much it gaps up, you've given away, you know, some potential profits. So that would be the other thing. And then the final thing you need to think about is earnings. I've seen stocks come down, print really nice hammers the day before earnings or the day of earnings. And then the market comes out that, you know, later in the day, um, you know, the stock gaps down because of poor earnings. And so that hammer means absolutely nothing. I don't take technical analysis too seriously when it comes to earnings. So if I see something looks great heading into earnings, that does not mean much to me. I'm not going to buy. I've seen stocks turn completely around with their earnings reports. So, but another good question. All right. Um, let's go on to the bullish engulfing candle. So we talked about the bearish engulfing candle. This is the exact opposite. So instead of an uptrend, you have a downtrend. And then instead of gapping up and selling off all day, you gap down off that downtrend and you, buy, you see buying all day. So there is a really bullish engulfing candlestick. And again, the problem is if you wait until the next morning, look what happens. You get it on the gap up. Next two or three days, you're frustrated with it. It's going the wrong direction. Um, I would be looking at this probably again once it gaps down um, if it got back up above a certain level intraday i might consider getting in but definitely by the end of the day i would be looking at that and then the other thing you have to consider is where do you think the stock can go to if this is in a longer term uptrend and this happens to be a really nice reversing candle off a short-term downtrend i may be looking for the stock to go up for weeks to the upside so i may have a lot of upside potential on the stock, but I have to make sure that whatever I'm thinking about in terms of upside, uh, more than offsets, I want to have at least two to one reward to risk off of putting in a stop, which is going to be at the bottom of this candle. So it's going to be a couple dollars down. So I want to make sure at least I have at least $4 to the upside on a, on a potential trade. And you can see that in this particular stock, Hartford, after doing this, it ended up trend, trending higher, went all the way back up to price resistance 
and then printed a black candle on the top. And now we're kind of in this sideways uh, consolidation mode right now. So again, these signals are more for short-term traders. If you're a buy and holder where you like to get in and hold stocks for many, many months, maybe years, reversing candlesticks probably should mean little to you. All right, let's move on uh, to the piercing candle. So I, I showed you the bearish engulfing, and then I showed you the dark cloud cover where it didn't quite become a bearish engulfing candle. Well, the piercing candle is kind of like the bullish engulfing, but it doesn't quite get to be a bullish engulfing. It stops in the upper half of the candle the prior day. So here's your downtrend. You gap down a little bit. You came back up, didn't quite fully engulf that prior day's candle. So that's considered a piercing candle. So again, this one to me wouldn't be quite as bullish as an engulfing candle just because it didn't quite take out that prior, all of the action from that prior day. So if you're looking at it, a 10 minute or 30 minute or 60 minute chart um, and comparing days, you would see higher uh, in this instance, probably you'd be looking at lower highs and lower lows. So you'd still have kind of that lower low, lower high pattern going on um, so that, you know, the piercing and the dark cloud cover aren't quite, don't give you quite those same signals as the um, engulfing candles would. But here, you do see lower prices and check out the MACD turning up. So you have a positive divergence and a, and a reversing candle. That, to me, is a pretty powerful combination. Now, after trending down for a while, couldn't get through the 20-day moving average. Once you get that reversing candle and you get a positive divergence, look at this, all of a sudden go right through that 20-day like, you know, like it's not even there. And immediately head for the 50 with a MACD getting close to the center line reset. But this uh, piercing candle, again, you're following a downtrend, so it doesn't matter. If you're seeing a piercing candle somewhere in the middle of going sideways, it's not giving you any kind of a signal. These are reversing signals. They have, there has to be a prior trend in play. So you've, it follows a downtrend. You gap lower, and then you rise to finish in the upper half of the prior day's candle. So it's not totally engulfing, but it finishes in the upper half. It signals that a decline is likely extended and that market makers are long on the stock. Higher volume helps to confirm this reversal. You can see as we were moving down, this actually was probably the heaviest volume in about two or three weeks uh, on this reversal. And again, you want to see that because you want to see that demand coming in. Um, and then once again, other technical signs should be considered. Short-term trading there's a lot of different ways to approach it, but you really want to try to get as many signals lining up in the direction of your trade as possible. So you want to be hitting price support. You want to be hitting a moving average. You want to be hitting a trend line. You want to be putting in a reversing candle. You want to, you know, all of these things combined, the more of these that you have, the better you should feel about your trade. And you throw in seasonal, you know, you're, you got this going in and all of a sudden maybe this is a great month for HCP. Maybe November tends to be historically bullish. That would be another piece of the puzzle. Um, so that's what you're really trying to do is to, to line up as much as you can in the direction of your trade. All right, the last thing I wanted to do here is I just wanted to talk about the uh, a trading example. And JD, this was the one that I provided back on Monday as a setup. So this kind of brings it full circle and gives you an idea of how I look at the market, how I look at individual stocks and stocks that I would consider trading. Um, JD clearly in a downtrend. And you might look at it and say, well, what the heck could you like here? Well, one thing you could like is that as it moves lower, it's got a positive divergence. If we could get a reversal with a positive divergence, that would start to mean something to me. Well, we did. We got a hammer. We had a hammer last Friday, a really nice hammer. Not only was it a nice hammer with increasing volume where you close back up, but notice that the low went right down to gap support. So now you're hitting gap support which had not been tested previously. I did circle this hammer. It's got more of like a long-legged doji, if you're familiar with dojis. A doji is like a hammer, except a doji, there's not really much difference or any difference between the open and the close. So you don't really have a rectangle here. You don't have a body of the candlestick. See how that is like a flat line going across? That means your open and your close were almost identical. So you open with a gap down, you trade much lower intraday, and then you come back up and you close 
and you hold the top of gap support. Look at the volume, pretty heavy days volume. And then look what happens. Six, seven days later, we're all the way back up to test resistance. And by the way, look at that false breakout. See that tail going up and failing to break above? Well, it broke above intraday, but it failed to hold. And look at what happens. You come right back down, almost down to price support again. That's This really, in a nutshell, tells you a lot about trading and what you're trying to accomplish with trading. Now, all these other blue circles that I put in here are kind of like hammer-looking things. But notice this one. It's after you go up a day. This isn't off of a downtrend. You haven't established any new lows with this tail. This one here, you've been going sideways for three days. Here, you actually gone down, but what, uh, from 45 and a half to 44 and a half over two or three days? And were you at any major support? No. Had you gone below any major moving averages? No. There just there was nothing else to confirm that hammer. So again, you want to try to use as many technical signals as possible to get through. So anyhow, with that, uh, that was about what I wanted to go through. So why don't we uh, move on and get into the 10 and 10. I know you're going to have another market update coming in a couple minutes. And John Hopkins, by the way, is going to join us from Earnings Beats for a very, very brief um, discussion on some of the key earnings that we've seen recently. And so John will be coming in here in just a few minutes as well. But, All right. uh, why don't we do that 10 and 10? Yes, let's get to it. And we'll start, as we said, with ECA. And uh, we're, we are requested as far as ECA to look at both the daily and weekly. So you can decide which one to save and annotate. All right. Well, I think I remembered seeing this. By the way, look at this hammer that hits right the 50-day end price support. Um, so we'll just kind of start with that because that fits into exactly what I was just going over. But right here. Got a lot of support coming in around this level, another uh, batch of lows about this level. And then you break down on pretty decent volume. You fail, look at this top right here, bearish engulfing candle, false breakout. That was the top at price resistance. And then finally you break out with solid volume and come down and you put in a huge hammer with pretty good volume here as well. It actually, this wasn't the big uh, volume bar, but it was still pretty good volume on this reversing candle. And then you head right back up again. I think ECA looks good. I think here we tried to make a breakout. MACD didn't look good. We went down to the 50-day. We put in a hammer and then came right back up. I think this chart looks really good. And I would be looking for, now that we've established a pretty good resistance here, now that we're breaking through, I would look for price support at $12 and then gap support at about eleven seventy-five and rising 20-day. Those are the three levels of support that you want to watch the downside. Okay. And the next one, actually, uh, somebody said we might be looking at a dark cloud cover candle on CWST. All right. I'm already loving this. These Everybody looking at the potential dark cloud cover and all these different candles. Wow. The only thing I would say here is we didn't get a gap up. So a dark cloud cover, normally you're going to see a gap up and then a, a reversal. I actually think what we have here is a really nice breakout. Looks like maybe a little bit of a cup handle kind of a thing where we break out with big volume. I'm assuming it was probably earnings related. So I actually like this stock. And um, the break, the two areas that I would be watching is the breakout level right here at about 19. I think you got good support there. And also that top of gap support right at 19. And then the rising 20 day moving average, which is 1853. So I think the zone, the support zone on the stock is going to be between 1850 and 19. All right. The next one I have for you is SGYP. This comes from Twitter. And it looks really interesting to me, at least on uh, my PMO and such. Yeah, I mean, we've got a double bottom. Um, possibly we're going to consolidate for a little while. Um, you know, we're in a bull market. I'm not a big fan of stocks that are downtrending in a in a bull market obviously they're relative laggards and i'm not really a bottom fisher so these are the type of stocks I, I tend to avoid but um it did come in with some nice volume off this prior low and if you recall the discussion we had with bruce frazier the other day he likes to look at this next low as it comes down what kind of volume what's well, definitely less volume than we saw on the way up and now we're starting to see today's volume by the way is very strong eight percent advance and volume is already almost 5 million shares 
looking maybe for a 10 million share day. So I see the volume. I th the makings of a bottom definitely are forming here, but I don't see confirmation until I can take out these highs right here. That would then, I think, execute this double bottom. So a breakout above, say, 355, 360 would be bullish. In the meantime, I think we just consolidate. Okay. Next one I have is NUE, Nucor. And uh, they mentioned a possible cup and handle breakout possibility. All right. Well, I think what we're probably looking at here is a cup. The problem with, a, with using that type of a pattern here is that it's not coming off of an uptrend. You might say, well, here's an uptrend. Well, technically, the cup should not be more than half of the uptrend, the depth of the cup. And you can see that not only did the depth of the cup go more than half of this uptrend, but it went beyond the uptrend. So I don't look at this as a cup. That's just me personally, you know, the way I was taught with these patterns is that this is a bullish continuation pattern and it needs to follow an uptrend and follow the rules. Now, having said all that, I wouldn't consider it a cup and handle, but I would consider it at least in a short term uptrend where it has been bullishly holding on to the 20 day moving average. So the first thing I would probably do if I was annotating here was just for, as a reminder that we've gotten that 20 crossover the 50 so it's a golden cross and the 20 day has been holding really nicely as support now to really get this thing going i think you got a clear price resistance and this is where i think that the, the stock could struggle so i'd be looking right now from maybe 57 dollars to 61 dollars price range and we'll see which way it breaks first all right the next one i have for you is Intel. I actually wrote about it last week. I think it was last week about a possible parabolic. And I'm seeing it sort of at this point, it's kind of topping off a little bit, but uh, be curious your thoughts of whether it'll go higher or not. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't be a buyer just because it's so overbought. I, you know, the thing I love about stocks that consolidate for a long time and Intel, if you talk to anybody who owned it prior to September, they would have probably told you how frustrated they were with this stock because it just wasn't going anywhere for a long period of time. And they would have been correct. I mean, you can see the tops. Um, you know, overall, it's not a horrible pattern. I see, you know, sideways consolidation off of a prior uptrend here, you know, going sideways. But this breakout is coming with some a lot of volume. I think there is tremendous accumulation. It's also coming at a time when a lot of money is moving away from AMD. So it's almost like that the money coming out of AMD is fueling Intel. I don't, you know, I agree with you, Aaron. I think it is a little bit parabolic and I don't want to buy it when it's so overbought, but I don't think this run is over. Uh, right. I don't, I don't think that Intel is the type of stock that goes through these parabolic moves and then dies. I mean, this is right. a company that's done well for a long time, but I think this sideways consolidation is actually setting it up for this kind of a move to the upside. I'd have to see, you know, maybe some kind of a pullback, I don't know if we'll get that rising 20 week moving average anytime soon because that's down what 30. Oh, right. yeah. But I'd have to at least see it come down out of overbought territory. Yes. I, I think, you know, really the, the point for me too was if you're in a parabolic, uh, that's, that's one of the few times I know for myself, I use a trailing stop because, you know, typically in a parabolic, you don't have to worry about it pulling back so far to, to, to get your stop to trigger, but it's there when things, do start to go bad. So just just a thought there, but I thought that one was interesting. Okay, next I'm going to give you PetX, P-E-T-X from Twitter. Um, I, I looked at the candle on that one. I thought that was pretty interesting. So <laughs> I wanted your thoughts. Yeah, this one, again, it's, it's making a huge move. It's up 20% and it's basically gone nowhere. I mean, you can see what happened after it lost, made a huge move down, didn't really go any lower and then went right back up into the gap, you know, kind of fill the gap. And this one's going up. Will it go back down? I don't know. I, I, I just see a lot of sideways stuff going on with this stock in a market that's been going higher. So I like the action today, but I'm probably not going to be interested in a trade unless it's either at the bottom of this trading range or at the top. And if I owned it and it got to the top, I would sell until I saw the breakout. All right. The next one is for our Canadian friends, xeg.to. I'm seeing a little bit of a 
little flag forming there. All right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really like the fact that it's starting to stair step higher. I think this really does speak a lot to what uh, Bruce was talking about. We had him on the other day um, from a Wyckoff uh, perspective. So if you take a look and, you know, he might disagree, but I, I hope he wouldn't. <laughs> um, but if I take a look at like the sideways action here, um, you can almost see where we had this one last heave ho to the downside before we started to rally. And then we took out this prior or, or this uh, move back to the upside here at about 1130 or so. And you can see pretty good volume on that move and it held on the pullback. And now we've broken out again. So I think that this looks pretty good. Uh, this is an, a capped energy index ETF. And of course, energy shares have been performing much better over the past couple of months. So I would be fine with this one. All right. The next one I have is uh, Starbucks and really interesting action today, I have to say. Yeah, they reported last night. I didn't really have a chance to look too deeply at their report. They did gap down. This is a great company. I'm not at all surprised. Uh, I think probably, again, this is a longer term uh, st uh, stock that longer term has been moving higher. It did go down. And with this heavy distribution, uh, went all the way back down close to maybe even just below this support area. But what I'm seeing now is a breakout above this consolidation zone that it's been in for the past few months. So I think right here was a low and then right in here was the high. And you can see most of this action for the past three or four months taking place in this area. Today's volume is very heavy as it breaks back out to the upside. I like Starbucks. And I think it goes higher. I think it eventually is going to go back up and test those highs in early June. All right. Let's uh, go to Akamai, A-K-A-M. All right. This is one of the best stocks in the market during the month of March, I believe it is. Hmm. Um, so let me just see. Whoops, that was number eight. Okay, so Akamai. Yeah, I wrote about this one not too long ago, and I think they came out with decent earnings. Yeah, gapped up. And now it's coming back down into gap support. This is getting back to the reversing candle. One of the things I'd love to see on this stock is – a move down intraday, down below $52, say to 51, 51 and a quarter, and then come back up and close above 52 so that we hold on to that 20 day moving average with a false breakdown intraday. And then I would be looking for the stock to rally back initially to the open after earnings, which was at about 55, 70 or something, it looks like in that range. Um, but that was huge volume. I think the downtrend is broken. And I would, I'm actually looking for some kind of reversal here. Maybe a cup forms and we can head back up this way. But overall, I think the trend is now to the upside. Finally got some good volume on this push to the upside. Um, off of this uptrend, that was the black candle with earnings. And you can see we continued to weaken after that candle printed. But now we're down near gap support. And I'd be looking for this one to reverse back to the upside pretty soon. All right. And the last one, uh, big name, Tesla. It looks interesting. I mean, it's on support. Could be an island reversal forming. I don't know. It's uh, a lot of stock gone. All right. Sorry. I just wanted to put That's something right. on the chart. I forgot to annotate it. That's what I did when I was trying to fill your position there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So what was the last one? Tesla. Tesla. Yeah, Tesla. This was a trade gone bad for me. I, ended up, I think I ended up losing a little bit on this one. And this was the candle I got in on. On Tesla, you could see the volume picked up. Seattle yeah, was at support and was down intraday. Looked like it was breaking down, then reversed. It was one of those I did buy intraday on the reversal. I had a stop buy in, and the stock was up probably twenty dollars for me at one point. I didn't take it. Um, shame on me. But anyway, it came back down and it went below the three forty level. And it was on that candle. Volume was picking up. I said, "That's enough. I'm getting out." So I got out, and the stock has continued going lower. It doesn't look good here. But actually on the longer chart, I'm going to annotate this on that long-term chart because if you pull up on Tesla, all the prior highs, this stock consolidated for a long time after topping at about 280, 290. And so this was a three-year sideways consolidation. We broke out. We're now going back down and testing this area. I think 280 is kind of a line in the sand for me on Tesla. I'd be careful if the stock closes below 280, especially if the volume's heavy. But I think this could be an opportunity. Um, it's just one of those stocks, you know, they don't have earnings, so it's a risky play. But 
there was a lot of accumulation taking place on Tesla throughout most of 2017. So this may be an opportunity to get it uh, much cheaper. I haven't jumped in at this point. If we hit 280, I may consider it. All right. And that concludes our 10 and 10. Not bad. Not bad. Yeah, we started a little late, went a little late. Yeah. You know, is what All it right. is. Well, I will get uh, to that first or second market update and then uh, we can get um, John on here. Sounds good. All right. So let's get to our member page here. I'm going to show you just real quick our predefined alerts. I'm, I forgot to mention these in our first market update, but you can see the Dow has set a new all time high and uh, industrial sector starting to suffer just a little bit. We're seeing the BPI below 80 on that Russell 2000 cross below 1500. And as we looked at earlier, small caps seem to be struggling just a bit more than some of the others. I wanted to look really quickly at our scooter movers. At this point, you can see top 10, not too different, NVIDIA line. But I wanted to see which ones were moving the fastest uh, upward. And X-Ray is up almost 35 on the scooter. Not a surprise. Usually when you see these scooter movers, you're gonna end up with these sorts of uh, ca uh, candlesticks or OHLC bars, which I use. I think what's interesting here is we had a flag and now we've basically put in another flagpole, possibly a uh, nice breakout. But, you know, at this point, we're still not seeing a close uh, above previous closes here at resistance uh, with a big move like this. I would look for a pullback for sure. So I thought that one was interesting to look at. And you can see there's where the scooter just shot toward the sky. So that was really all I wanted to uh, talk about on our final market update. Awesome. All right. Um, well, we do have our guest, uh, Mr. Hopkins from Earnings Beats. Uh, he's joining us a little later than usual today so that I could get through the candlestick segment. But uh, how are you doing, John? You with us? Yeah, I'm here, Tom. Awesome. Um, awesome. Let me tell you something. I'm like a kid in a candy store. You can kind of picture me sitting rubbing my hands together. Yeah. I don't know where to, it's, <laughs> it's like a smorgasbord of stocks that uh, have reported their earnings, you know, beat expectations, moved up higher. And now I'm just waiting patiently, you know, for some of these to come back. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had some, uh, you know, great, great success with this whole strategy of uh, waiting for stocks to report earnings, the ones that beat, being patient and getting involved when they pull back. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple of, yeah, actually one yesterday, uh, BX, the, Black, the Blackstone Group, mm -hmm. um, got involved in that stock, had a little scare intraday. You can see that tail. <laughs> hammer, hammer on the 50 day. Yeah, hammer. Okay, but I thought we were going to get hammered out, you know, in the stop, but it, <laughs> it roared back. Yep. And uh, now, you know, if we can get this stock uh, with a decent close, I think it can go higher here. So yeah. uh, we got involved in that stock. Another stock that, has been great just a few days ago, uh, P-E-T-S. So P-E-T-S is uh, a company that uh, we got involved in a couple dollars cheaper uh, just a few days ago. Made a great move, and um, I like the way it looks right now. You know, pull back a little bit today, but hold on pretty nice. There's another example. There's a shooting star. I mean, we went up four days and before earnings. We had that huge rally with earnings and printed that uh, shooting star candle. Now there was no false breakout, but that's still a reversing candle. And we, you know, when I see something like that on this kind of volume, um, all of a sudden jumping up to 5 million shares and a big reversal from the high, that tells me, and that, you know, everyone always asks with these gap, you know, with my gap trading strategies, you know, when do you buy, when do you sell? Well, a lot of times I think it's important to see not only whether you gap up or gap down with earnings, but also what happens in the ne next few days afterwards. Yeah. And so, you know, there you got a reversing candle, you come back down. You did go below gap support, but you held on to the prior lows, and now it does look like it's starting to turn back up. So it looks like a pretty good call hey, there. Do you have that one up on your screen? I'm seeing x ray up on your screen there. Uh, Am I not I have mine. <laughs> oh, yeah. What's that? We still have my screen up. Yeah. I'm oh. seeing I'm seeing X-ray up there. Yeah, <laughs> X-ray X-ray, you're stealing my thunder. My bad, my bad. What was the first? There we one? go. 
What was the first one we talked about? The first one was BX. Okay, so BX. Yeah. Blackstone. So, yeah, here's the hammer. So I just want mm-hmm. to make sure everybody can see that. Sorry, that was my bad. Um, and now, uh, you know, it's reversing day. Actually, I like it. hammer and then possibly a bullish engulfing candle on yeah. the hammer. Um, so you got maybe a, uh, you know, double dose of uh, reversing candles here. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, the second one was PETS. Yep. Been a nice winner already. Yep. And then here you go. This is the gap up. That was the shooting star I was talking about. So you gap up, you trade higher intraday, and then you come back down close near the low of the day. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you just, it's a visual picture. That's why I love candlesticks. Yeah. It just tells me, okay, we had a nice report, gap up, trade, it looked great intraday. And then by the day's close, the sellers started to kick back in and yep. that's back up for a little bit of weakness. But yeah, pulled back nice though. Yeah. Yep. And the last one, uh, SYNT, this is another one we put out a couple days ago. Mm-hmm. Love the way this this one looks. Look at that beautiful move. You know, big gap up in volume. I was pulled back. I was going to wait for it to get to the 20. It's not coming back to the 20. Um, it wants to keep moving higher. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes they come back. Sometimes they don't. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I, you know, when I look at a stock like this, I, I tend to look at uh, the top of gap support. I love these stocks when they gap up. Mm-hmm. Make huge gap ups. I mean, this was a nineteen dollar stock. It opened at twenty two, and you would think, okay, well, people are going to probably take profits from twenty two. They just got a fifteen percent bump, you know, at the open. But instead, this thing went higher all day long. So that tells me that there's some accumulation taking place. And yeah, the pullbacks generally give you a much better opportunity to get in lower prices. So, yeah, the last thing I just want to mention because I know you got a lot to cover today. But uh, you and I are going to do a webinar, uh, earning season trading candidate webinar. It's going to be Monday, mm-hmm. uh, this Monday, November 6, 4.30. As a matter of fact, if you go to our our website, earningsbeats.com, you will see up at the top, there's a link for anybody interested. There's a webinar link. They can just click on that webinar link uh, to register. But it's going to be fantastic because we're going to uh, give people access to multiple high reward to risk trading candidates. Uh, you're going to talk about how to establish a powerful chart list. It's going to be awesome, and the, and the timing couldn't be better. I'm telling you, if you you know if you buy into the concept of getting involved in stocks that report great earnings, that pull back to key support, and then get them when they pull back, uh, and keep a nice tight stop just in case they go against you. It's been a tremendous formula uh, all year long, and uh, particularly in this type of market. So. Anybody who wants to join Tom and I Monday, just go to earningsbeats.com. You'll see a link up at the top. Click on webinar. You can get registered and looking forward to it, Tom. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. So next week, if you haven't already heard, uh, Monday through Friday, we're going to be going, you know, we're going to be doing Market Watchers Live now, five days a week instead of three. And because I am the glutton for punishment that I am, I'm going to do another webinar with John uh, on Monday afternoon. Uh, I, is there a psychologist in the house? Is there anybody out there that can? Hey, you know, Tom, with me for a while. Yeah. Some people say they never met a golf course. You know, they didn't like. Yeah. I don't think you've met a webinar you haven't liked. Well, I'll let you know on Monday afternoon. <laughs> I can't wait. I'm looking forward to it. It should be great. All right. Always, always great having you on here. By the way, uh, we didn't get a chance to talk about Apple, but Apple, you know, was obviously leading the market up here. Early. Oh yeah. Pull this this chart up real quick. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, it gapped up. It was already, you know, the market was anticipating good news. Look at the volume already today. This will be another one we can talk about another day, but uh, Apple having a really good day helping technology in the NASDAQ. Tremendous. All yeah. right, my friend. All right. Have a great weekend. All right. Take care. All right. I know, Aaron, you want to talk about sentiment, so I'm not going to take up any more time and let you have the screen here. Well, actually, I did want to share something just uh, because, because I can. Uh, Timer Digest, timerdigest.com. I actually made the cover, so I wanted to let everybody know. uh, To learn more about Timer Digest, you can go to their website. But basically, they... Uh, we report all of our timing signals to them for the market in general, gold and bonds, and then they rank us based on our calls. Currently, I'm not in the top 10 for the year, but I am in the top 10 for three months and six months. And if things continue the way they are, I should make the top 10 in another month or so. So I'm pretty excited about that. But anyway, just so you uh, Y'all know I was out there and on a cover. I thought that was pretty cool. It is awesome. See, you can carry that a lot better than me, you know, with that picture. I got a fake <laughs> made for radio. 
<laughs> They're always really generous with them. <laughs> My last cover was pretty nice too, I thought. <laughs> They've got a really good artist. All right, so let's get to it on sentiments. All right, so these are the indicators I generally look at for you. I'm going to start with the put call ratios. Uh, not anything really just yet to really report here because we look for uh, important tops and bottoms, but they're, it's way better. <laughs> it's much better when you see them, my California lingo coming out here. It's a lot better when you see the tops coming at least all the way up to here in order to get a good read on what will happen. But typically when we get tops, that's when we see the rallies. And when we get the bottoms, that's typically when we're going to see the, um, excuse me, we're going to see the decline. So you can see right here, we had these tops. That means people are pretty nervous here. And so once you get that, you usually will see a rally off of that top. So we did get a top here. And if you look in the thumbnail where the top came in, it came in right before this uh, punch upward by the S&P, or in this case, the uh, S&P 100. So uh, it, it's pretty accurate, but right now we're kind of mid-range. We are heading lower. So the next thing we're gonna start looking for is a bottom, hopefully down here towards uh, oversold territory. Uh, so we'll have to wait and see on that one, but that was the put call ratio. AAII is the American Association of Individual Investors. And if you go to their website, you can take uh, the quiz. Do you think, uh, are you bullish or bearish or neutral? And this is what they report uh, at the end of the week on Thursday to tell you where everybody stood. And as you can see, we want to, I'm looking at the bull bear ratio. When the ratio is one, of course, there's an even amount of bulls and bears. So what I want to see is the ratio get very, very low, meaning there's a lot of bears, or get very, very high, and that means there's a lot of bulls. Because with sentiment, you want to see those climactic moves, and then you think opposite. Because when everybody is bullish, that's typically when you see the reversals. Now, granted, and you can look at it right here, since November, I mean, we've had a few uh, stutters, uh, some consolidation zones, but uh, in general, being very bullish hasn't hurt the market at this point. However, I'm still keeping an eye on it because uh, it's it's always good to have that information and have us uh, prepare just in case we end up with something a little more uh, than sideways consolidation. So at this point, we are starting to see some very uh, a little bit of a move here as far as the bullish sentiment is concerned. So we're looking at you know a 45 percent. Uh, right now that are bulls. And that has put our ratio up above one and a half. Now I have the red line here at two because that's really where I want to see things go. Uh, that's when we, like I said, we're getting, that's when we get those climactic readings. That's what we're looking for. So we're not quite there, but you can see that uh, bulls and even in the thumbnail, we're getting a trend higher. Uh, bears are still about the same. And I would like to see that shrink. Uh, that would also bring this uh, ratio much higher. So that is uh, the uh, American Association of Individual Investors. The one I want to look at now is the National Association of Active Investment Managers, uh, NAME. And these this uh, tells you how exposed the big money makers are to the market. They have to report. And so right now, you can see that the exposure has been really moving downward a lot. And it's interesting because we've been seeing the market moving higher. So there's been some nervousness. There's been some bearishness uh, out there and currently with active money managers. And so they're typically right. I'm not going to say that they aren't. Um, so we are seeing the exposure come back. So that that does worry me a little bit. Typically, you want to see uh, when you see the low exposure rate, that's when you start to look for the rally. And so the lower this gets, the better it is for the market. Uh, but I, I do find I'm, I am a little concerned here because when you compare the uh, individual investors, the AAII, remember, people are getting more bullish. And now we're seeing these active money ma managers starting to get bearish and they tend to be um, like I said, kind of correct on the market here. So the fact that they're pulling back um, 
is telling us there's might be a little bit of rocky road to come ahead, uh, but we're not seeing these really extreme uh, exposure readings. So uh, really extremely low. So when we start seeing them get lower and the money managers start getting exceedingly bearish, then that's when we want to start for that looking for a nice active uh, strong rally. But we're not quite there. I, I really think that uh, we could see their exposure pull back even more. But the fact that it is lower and typically you do get a rally off of uh, low readings, I think that's important to note. Uh, Wall Street sentiment survey. This uh, is, of course, the survey we all take on Friday. Uh, you guys and myself and Tom, um, but I report my my finding or my reading to um, Mark Young of the Wall Street sentiment survey, who uh, will be on our show later in November, but we'll talk more about that later. So you can see that everybody pretty much uh, in the market timer arena, because that's who really gives their sentiment for this particular survey. So uh, the majority of us have been very bullish and we're getting more bullish. And that is a little bit of a concern. But remember, with the Wall Street sentiment survey, it only asks uh, the market timers, what do you think is going to happen next week? So this is a real short term um, sentiment chart and sentiment survey. So we saw the ratio move very high. So you can see, obviously, you have more bulls on uh, this last week. And apparently they're correct, as are you, Tom, uh, because I think we're going to finish the week up uh, over a percentage point at this point on the S&P. So we'll have to we'll have to see. But I think uh, the bulls are going to be ahead on this one. Um, I have the ICI and I don't normally show this because they are, these readings are really, I, I guess I could say old because they do not report for, you know, there's at least a month lag time before you get the report. Um, but I think this one's pretty interesting. Uh, it does tell you uh, as far as the ICI is concerned and that's, oh gosh, I always, ah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, um, it's a place for research, basically, but uh, you can go to ICI.com. I could do that right now, but I'm not. Uh, but it's very interesting to see the assets in stock mutual funds continuing to rise. You know, typically when you see that get, uh, that's bearish, right? Everybody's not putting the money in, in equities. They're, they're going into mutual funds. And typically, as you can see, when we get these tops, they come in before a pretty sizable decline. Uh, but we're still rising at this point. And, you know, I'm sure everybody's like, well, why are the levels so low versus, well, there's, there's more uh, liquidity right now in the market. So that's why you're going to see those higher readings. But the main thing I wanted to point out is the fact that that's still rising. Uh, when we get, when we see that top out, when people, uh, when that tops out, I think that'll be the interesting time to start looking for some decline. So that is ICI. I'm going to show you the gold and silver sentiment. And I use, um, in this case, the Central Fund of Canada. It's a closed end fund. They own metals. And so, uh, you know, when, when you buy that, you're going to end up either um, getting it at a discount based on what their holdings are or a premium, depending on what their holdings are. And what we want to see are these discount rates. We want to see them get um really overextended where, you know, they're, they're just really trying to, you know, people aren't buying it so that uh, you're going to see more and more discount on, on what the, the fund is worth based on its uh, price. And at this point, what I'm seeing, of course, is we're still not nearly as uh, bearish as you would want to see on gold to get a nice uh, rally going. I mean, you can see when we get these uh, extreme readings, they typically appear right before a nice rally in gold. Uh, right now, we're just not seeing that. Uh, I wouldn't see this as uh, bullish or bearish. I think we're pretty neutral here as far as uh, the discount premiums, but uh, something to keep an eye on uh, for gold. And so the fact that I'm not seeing these really uh, bearish readings at this point, I've not been really uh, thrilled with gold, and I continue to not be very thrilled with gold at this point, although it seems to be holding some support. I'll go look at that chart in a, in a moment. So I know we're running out of time here. This is the Ridex ratio chart, and we uh, cover a group of the Ridex funds. They report their assets uh, at the end of every day. So we can track how 
many assets are in each of these uh, bear funds, money markets, or the bull uh, equity sector funds. And that tells you, based on the assets, where that money flow is going. And that's, of course, what you want to watch. At this point, what I was looking at, and again, the, the thumbnail is a lot more helpful, but the arrows tell you what I'm seeing in the thumbnail. And right now we can see it's really mostly flat here. No, there's not a lot of uh, new assets or monies going into the bear funds at this point. And we can see that as far as money markets are concerned, we are seeing a rise in that. And that does go along with that ICI chart that I showed you. And typically, um, I consider when people move into the money markets that they're feeling more neutral. They're certainly not bullish or they'd be in equities. We're seeing the equity uh, assets here, the bull sector fund assets, they're starting to decline at this point. So between money sort of leaving equities and moving into money markets, I would say people are feeling neutral. If we were seeing a, an increase in the bear funds, then I would say, well, of course, people are feeling bearish at this point. And you can see with most of those sentiment charts, still kind of in a neutral situation. We're really not seeing climactic readings on uh, one way or the other. So, but at this point, you know, it looks like people are, are sitting a little bit middle of the road when it comes to the Ridex funds. So I'm going to show you really quick, and I know we're almost out of time, but I really wanted to show you the gold chart, so I'm going to do that. I got to show you the oil chart earlier. All right. And here we go. I was expecting a breakdown. I'm not going to lie. Uh, we had gotten this intermediate term trend model uh, neutral signal when the 20 crossed below the 50. And you can see at this point, everything, all of the EMAs are still above the 200, which is, is positive. And you can see we got that bounce off of the 200 day EMA, uh, which also doubled as support here at that 1265 level. And I'm starting to see the PMO trying to turn up, um, but I, I'm, still not, I'm still not a fan of gold. I still think we're gonna see it move lower. If the market struggles a little bit in the next week, uh, you know, we might see gold moving sideways. We could be putting in a double bottom here, uh, which would be nice reversal pattern, but I'm, I'm gonna wait and see. If we do get that double bottom, the neckline would be all the way actually up here. And if we got the breakout from there, it would basically put us back here to test uh, overhead resistance around um, 1360, the high really for the last year. So I, I'm still bearish on gold just because of that signal that came in. And even though I'm seeing deceleration and the PMO moving up right now, I'm still not... Um, I'm just not on board with this rally going past that 1300 mark. I think it's going to get uh, turned away there. We'll have to see if I'm on the right uh, path or not. So with that, I will uh, end the show <laughs> on my sentiment, but I'm going to move it back to you, Tom, and we can uh, talk a little bit more before we leave. Okay. Um, well, obviously, one thing we need to do is come up with our pick for next week on ah. the S&P 500. Indeed. And as I said, I think you won. You were a bull, and I went neutral for the week. And uh, looking at what we're looking at as far as the my indicators go, gosh, I, I really hate to get too um, bearish. And I hate to do neutral, um, but I think I'm going to go neutral again for next week. I, I really think we need to shake out a little bit here and a little bit more sideways action. Um, but we'll have to see. I know earnings are coming in pretty strong, and that certainly helped the NASDAQ 100. Yeah, I'm... Uh, I know uh, it's hard this week, isn't it? Well, there are a lot of earnings now that are out, and we saw what happened with Facebook. I mean, Facebook, you know, had a pretty nice move heading into earnings and then reported great earnings, and stocks come down a couple of days, you know, since then. And I think the market could suffer a similar fate. The, the problem is that just about every area of the market still looks okay to me. So when you start to see one area break down, money simply just moves in something else. And that's why we haven't been able to see much sustained selling. Um, but I do think the S&P is very overbought. The weekly RSI now in the S&P is 77, which if you look back over the last five years, I don't think there's been a reading any higher than that. So, you know, we just got past earnings, just made a new all-time high. I'm going to I'm going to just don't read too much of this. I'm just going to be bearish for the next week. All right. 
I mean, that's the thing. I, I, I'm feeling bearish too about next week, but I, I not enough to, to be a bear, I guess. I, I'm more on the neutral side. I think ultimately we're going to finish uh, mostly unchanged. Well, I find it very difficult to be bearish when the volatility index is sitting at nine and a quarter. Right. Well, to me, though, that can sometimes be an, uh, you know, an exhaustion too. sometimes. I mean, in the very short term, when I see that VIX move really low, honestly, it, it's time for it to, you know, the market to maybe spike up uh, a little bit. And uh, yeah, we'll have to see. Yep. So I'm going to be bearish and we'll just stick with that. I, one of the things I'm going to be watching is to see what the 10 year treasury yield does. Um, a lot of a lot of earnings reports out this week. Of course, that doesn't really impact the the bond market too much, um, except that when you have strong earnings, you get a lot of money rotating away from the bond market into the equity market. But some of these uh, uh, ec economic reports that we've seen uh, suggest maybe things are not quite as strong economically as maybe we thought a week or two ago, and maybe that's why the Fed you know, held off and is looking to raise maybe in December, they want to get some more evidence. So perhaps we'll see the yield move back down a little bit, but we seem to be in this range right now on the yield between about 233 and 245. And I'm not going to feel too good about stocks if we take out that low at 233, because that's going to be a signal that more money is rotating into the bond market. So that's something to watch as we finish out today and head into next week. But I, this is not a strong bearish signal for me. I'm, I think everybody listens to the show knows I'm pretty bullish the market. It's just, I think we've gone so far and we're, we're so overbought. It would just, it would be nice if the market would just pull back a little bit and just right. consolidate for a while. I agree. So, all right. Well, that is it. That is going to be it for this week. Again, if you missed earlier today or you missed when Chip Anderson was on, on Wednesday, we are next week moving to five days a week. So if you've been if you've been wanting to see us more than the three days a week, you're going to get your wish. I told you, you know, if you post things in that survey, we listen and we have gotten some plenty of feedback in the past. So why don't we do this five days a week? And so now we're doing it five days a week. Um, and it is it's a 90 minute show. It's not designed necessarily for everybody to be in here for 90 minutes. If you can make it and you enjoy it, that's great. But if you can only come in 30, 40 minutes at a time, you know, feel free. We uh, love to have you in here whenever you can can join us. A couple of uh, quick announcements. Number one, next Friday, Aaron will be uh, providing a special segment on chart patterns. So very similar to what we've done recently. Uh, Aaron talked about the PMO. I talked about trading gaps and uh, candlesticks, reversing candlesticks earlier today. So she will be looking at the chart patterns next Friday. So mark your calendar accordingly. We do have some additional guests coming up. We'll talk about more. Uh, more on that next week. And then again, um, Market Watchers moving to five days next week. So uh, stay tuned. We are looking forward to it. Um, really glad to, to do the show. We both enjoy it a lot. And it's, it's fun. And uh, I like the, the uh, back and forth that we get with the chat room um, and everybody's participation. So we certainly enjoy that. Uh, but thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Please complete the survey as you exit. I'd love to know what you thought of the reversing candlesticks earlier and what you think of our, our show in general. Uh, we do look at the feedback. I review every comment, as does Aaron, and we do use those comments and your responses to help shape future shows, um, i.e. five days a week next week. Um, and as a reminder, Market Watchers Live will now air Monday through Friday from noon to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time starting next week. I want to wish everybody a great Friday afternoon. Have a great weekend. Spend some quality time with your family and friends. And we'll see you back in here on Monday. Happy trading, everybody. 